Good evening, everyone. I call this May 17th, 2023 meeting of the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority to order. Councilor Jones and Member Benavides are excused. All other members are present. Notice is hereby given that the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority met at, 5, at 4 p.m. this afternoon for a closed meeting to discuss pending litigation proceedings. The meeting was held in the council committee room on the ninth floor of the Albuquerque Government Center. The matters discussed in the closed meeting were limited only to those specified in the notice. I need a motion and a second to approve the statement be included as part of the minutes and go into an open session. Uh, we'll call a motion from Councillor Davis, second from uh, Councillor Feeblecorn, uh, and then all, all in any discussion? Seeing none, uh, all in favor, please signify with a raised hand. Seeing none opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, item number two, invocation and pledge. We'll have a moment of silence and then the Pledge of Allegiance led by Commissioner Baca. Thank you, Commissioner Baca. Uh, that takes us to item three, approval of minutes. I make a motion to approve the April 19th, 2023 minutes. Is there a second? Councillor Feeblecorn, thank you. Uh, any discussion on that item? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand to signify the affirmative. Seeing none opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, we have no proclamations and awards this evening, and that takes us to item number five, public comment. Ms. Salas, do we have anyone signed up to speak? We do have one speaker, Elaine Hebbard. Okay, welcome, Ms. Hebbard. Uh, you know the rules. We have three. You have. You will have three minutes to speak. With a warning at two and a half minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Elaine Hebbard. First of all, I want to commend the staff and the board for the discussions that you've been having for the last few months. They've been very thoughtful, thought-provoking, and I find them very informative. Thank you. That's not to say that I don't have more to add. For instance, while the statement was made that last month that the surface water had to be curtailed when the river flows went down below 122 CFS. That's not exactly true. Native river water going below 122 CFS, that's the curtailment number. You could run all the San Juan Chama water just about that you wanted to within limits and just divert that. You'd have to lose some for evaporative losses and other things, but it could be modeled. That's the kind of nuanced information that would help the board make certain decisions. I have made several other recommendations towards being more open and transparent and involving more tra uh, public participation in the written comments that I have submitted, which I would like to have added to the record. Summarizing those comments, make the portal open to submit comments like the county and the city has. There's nothing right now. How about allowing a virtual participation? like what was available with COVID. Another one would be to use the TCAC more effectively. Instead of giving them 10 items to have to look at, like in April, take one item, like the asset management plan, and really delve into it. Also, perhaps letting them set their agenda and or interview some of their own um, fellow members. Open up the CIP process. Right now, the city and the county have a pretty open process. The utility uses the one that's developed by, with internally, brought forward to you, presented to the board and the TCAC, and then you vote on it. How much do you know, really, what goes on into creating those projects? And especially since you're going to be borrowing, instead of $56 million this year, $121 million. So knowing what those things are about would be very helpful. Tracking them online, maybe with a portal, or at least having a report every year would be very helpful so you can see what's been proposed, what happened, and what's going to happen. The, <clears throat> um, it all goes back to sort of oversight and helping with the board. The city council has staff to review and help them ask questions of the mayor. 
There's nothing like that here. Having staff or having elected board members or other oversight might be a possibility. Posting data online will help all of us know what's happening and why we need to take actions under several programs. And it will help us with the state engineer coming next month to talk to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hebbard. Uh, being a new member to the board, I, I do appreciate all of your, your time you put into your comments, both in person and what you submit online. And uh, I, I think I speak for all of us in appreciating your, uh, your involvement. That concludes public comment. That takes us to item six, announcements and communications. Uh, our next scheduled meeting will be held June 28th, 2023 at 5 p.m. right here in the Vincent Griego Council Chambers. Item number seven, which is our introduction or first reading of legislation. We have R23-13, amending water service policies for the South, water, South Valley Drinking Water Project. And we have uh, Liz Anderson to present. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, I am Elizabeth Anderson, Chief Planning Officer for the Water Authority. I'm bringing this, um, amend this R23-13, amending water service policies for the South Valley Drinking Water Project today to you for introduction. Um, it'll be coming for recommend, rec recommended approval in June. Um, this, this is an amendment to a resolution that was originally adopted in May of 2008 that was for um, part of the Valley Utilities Project, looking at the South Valley Drinking Water Project. So this, we've already completed construction of phases one through seven of the project. This will authorize um, service to the area that's already been funded for phases eight and nine of the project. So the county, um, thank you to the county for providing ARPA funding to support this project. Um, it's going to extend drinking water to, um, to, to residents in the, in the South Valley there. Um, and with the addition of this um, phases eight and nine, this will complete the area conceived under the original plan um, that was put forth by Bernalillo County for the areas to be served by the South Valley Drinking Water Project. Um, residences, let's see here. And I stand for any questions. Oh. Any questions from board members? Uh, I do have one for you, actually. So um, I believe it's in section two. It talks about newly developed properties inside the area, but outside the water store authorities established service territory shall pay the WRC. Newly developed properties inside both shall not pay. And I'm just kind of trying to understand the nuance between why certain properties pay and certain properties don't. That just has to do with the way that, that development happens within the Water Authority service area. If you're within the established service area, no customers pay the water resources charge. Outside of that, they pay the water resources charge. And that's how the, uh, the water resource is established to provide water to that extended area. OK, I think I understand that. Thank you. Uh, so with that being said, do we have a motion on this item? Motion from Councillor Davis, uh, I'll second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, um, call for a vote. All in favor, please raise your hand to signify approval. All in favor, passes unanimously, and we'll see this back here in June. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, that takes us to item eight, our consent agenda, and we actually have uh, a, a quick change from Councillor Davis. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the consent agenda item A, which is C23-8, uh, includes an approval of a contract with a communications firm. As you may know, I own some newspapers. The Water Authority is one of our customers for advertising. And so I have an agreement at the city um, that I don't participate in approving any media contracts that may or may not flow through one of those organizations. And so I'm going to recuse myself from this item on the consent agenda if we can pull it for a standalone vote. Very good. So we will consider item C23-8 separately. So this is for the consent agenda now consisting of items B and C. Do we have a motion to approve? Motion from Member Real. Second from Commissioner Barboa. Any further discussion here? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Passes unanimously. And then are, are we going to consider this uh, immediately after? OK. So that takes us to uh, what is now item, or item 8A. Standalone, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. A uh, second from Member Real. Any discussion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, does this mean now we get to talk about Councillor Davis for a little bit? <laughs> Perhaps. 
Yeah. 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 privilege. No. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, seeing no further discussion, all in favor, please raise your hand to signify. And uh, that passes unanimously. Councillor Davis, welcome back. Uh, item nine, approvals. We'll need a motion to second and vote on each. Item A is 023-1, amending the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility uh, Authority Water and Sewer Rate Ordinance to increase utility expansion charge, septic tank, and chemical toilet charge by 4.38% and update the water and sewer credit amounts and update terms. This is the second read of this item, and we have Ms. Adrienne Candelaria here to present. All right. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, as you stated, we uh, introduced this back in April, so this is uh, on the agenda for approval. And uh, what we've got in front of you would be increasing the utility expansion charge, the septic tank charge, chemical toilet charge, that's by 4.38%. Um, that is according to the engineering news record average for last year. That's basically like a cost, a cost of living increase if you want to look at it that way. Um, and also, and kind of more importantly of interest to the board, is an update to the water and sewer credit for our low-income customers. We haven't seen a change in that rate in quite some time. And actually what we decided through some analysis is to not set the rate at a fixed dollar amount, but rather to tie it to the fixed charge for water meter and our fixed charges, so that whenever those might increase due to rate changes, so will that credit to those customers. So they maintain the credit on their bill. Uh, and the total increase or the net increase that they'll see starting in July is an increase on their credit of $7.84. Um, that kind of summarizes what we've got as far as the amendments and the ordinance. Um, and I stand for any questions. Any questions from the board? Not seeing any. Uh, do we have a motion to approve? A motion from Member Real. I'll second. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. We have uh, unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item B, 9B, R23-10, appropriating funds for operating the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2023 and ending June 30th, 2024. And we also have a uh, joint presentation here for uh, this item and the next item, item C, which is the capital program. Mr. Alred, um, thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my name is Dan Alred. I'm Chief Financial Officer for the Water Authority. Just go through a little abbreviated presentation. Um, again, no rate revenue adjustment proposed in this budget. Um, we assumed nominal growth in our service area. We assumed the consumption levels of 127 gallons daily per capita. This budget does include an addition of six FTEs. Um, we begin our $1.4 million transfer to the water 2120, which will be done um, every year and then increasing in about four years um, in the amount we transfer. This budget includes a two and a half percent increase in health insurance premiums for our employees, a half percent increase in parapension contributions, and a two percent increase in wages. It also includes as a one-time um, payment of $750 after taxes um, as negotiated with the contracts with the unions last year that equates to about a 3% increase across the board for our, for our um, employees this year. Last year, they received a 5% increase with a $1,000 lump sum adjustment. And then um, the last year of the contracts next year, which includes another 2% rate increase, and it does include another um, smaller lump sum adjustment. Um, this budget has increased in operating costs fuel costs, chemical costs, um, due to supply chain issues, inflation, and we continue to maintain a 112th fund balance as mandated by the rate ordinance. Um, I'll just go ahead and just skip through the slides since we disapproved it, but um, just some highlights of the rate ordinance. Real quickly, right after um, this rate increase, this is how we compare to the communities in the Southwest, um, which all um, have some of the the lowest rates. We, we operate very effectively, create a lot of efficiencies to make up for extra costs. 
to continue to um, um, keep these rates at these levels for our customers. Next slide. Um, our priorities for this year's budget, um, the rate reserve fund is fully funded at $9 million. Um, it has been for several years. That is also mandated by the rate ordinance. Um, that's in time, or used in case in times of um, down revenue that we can use that without having an emergency rate increase. Um, we're gonna install another 20,000 additional AMI meters in-house, um, develop and inspect an inspection program for our drinking water reservoirs as mandated by NMED. Um, implementation of the Colorado River Water Users MOU. Um, begin permitting for the aquifer storage and recovery projects that's in Water 2120 and develop a plan to increase renewable and green energy generation at our facilities. Um, another priority is um, there has been a revised lead and copper rule um, as, the, as mandated by EA, uh, EPA. Uh, so we're going to develop plans for public input and outreach and develop plans for monitoring data and data requirements. Uh, internally, we have implemented a staff mentor mentorship program to allow senior managers to mentor other staff and also a program to um, push forward innovation and have staff bring forth innovative ideas and move those through the organization. Um, conduct customer conversation sessions this fiscal year and continue focus on physical and cybersecurity safeguards of our assets. Um, our general fund projected revenues is total of $248 million, 55% coming from water, 40% coming from wastewater, and about 4.3 from miscellaneous revenue, and we will use some working capital um, work capital um, balance to offset um, future rate increase. Um, the next slide is our finance plan. Um, basically shows us over the next eight years and in last year and this current year is 10 years, um, what our revenues are expected to be, what our expenditures are expected to be, um, maintaining or ending work on capital and beginning work on capital balance to maintain 112 as mandated by the rate ordinance. Um, in this finance plan, it has been brought to the attention is every other year there's $56 million to borrow for our basic rehab program. In that same two year period, we transfer, um, make sure I say the right amount. Um, $76 million a year to the program. In the plan, every year we intend to increase the amount we spend for CIP by $3 million. That $3 million increase will be funded by cash. Currently, the rate ordinance says for um, the basic rehab program that 50% will be financed from, um, um, well, 50% at a minimum um, by cash. And then the remainder from um, debt borrowing. Right now it's 58% from cash finance, or from cash transfer from operating, and 42% from, um, from debt. Um, we do in this plan this year, plan on borrowing $121 million. There's two things to capital. One's the basic capital program, which we talked about. That takes care of the rehab of our basic capital in, in, in in the in in our um, service area, but we do have things that break unexpectedly that we have to fix. So the additional amount above the fifty six million dollars is to fix some items that really need to be fixed, and therefore we have to borrow the money to try to get that done. One is our 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 ponds at our water treatment plant are forty five percent full with sand and grit from the river. So we've lost capacity to those ponds. It's gonna cost anywhere between 28 to $28 million to get the sand out of those ponds. Um, and we need to do that to make sure that that plant operates as effectively and efficiently as possible. 
We have an interceptor that's in dire need that needs to be fixed. It could be catastrophic if it actually failed. It's going to be about $20 million to fix that interceptor or sewer line. So, so there is times where we ask and we put in the plan to borrow a mo money above and beyond the $56 million in the basic program. But it's, it's to take care of those types of issues that there are in dire needs for this utility to take care of. Um, again, we have very high bond ratings. Um, we, we, when we go to the market, we get a very, very good rates. Um, last time was less than 2%. Um, the other thing we do as an organization this, could we talk about how much debt service we pay? We pay our debt very quickly. Um, so we pay off most of our debt in 12 years. It's very rapid declining debt. But when you pay in 12 years, you have a little higher debt payments, but you pay a lot less in interest over the long haul. Um, and, and we do that, and we do that on purpose. And it does tend to look like sometimes you're paying a lot more in debt service, but we create that in, in essence to shorten um, the amount of time we pay off our debt. So I just kind of wanted to just bring that to everybody's attention. Um, the next slide um, is our general fund expenses. It's $248 million in expenses, um, $78 million to our debt service fund. Um, wages and benefits are $69.7 million. Operating expenses of $58.7 million. Our transfer to CIP is $38 million. Um, so that $76 million I talked about is that's one half of the $76 over a two year period. Um, our risk is $3.3 million, and our workers' comp is $700,000. Um, expenses at the program level um, $10.7 million for admin. Um, that includes HR. Um, legal and um, other groups. Financial services, 26 million. That includes all of the finances, the warehouses, um, um, IT and customer services and um, um, dispatch. Um, the plant division, 24.4 million. That's both the water and wastewater treatment plants and all the reservoirs and wells that we have throughout our service area. The fuel group, 29.5 million, which includes um, all of our lines, water lines, distribution lines, and all our collection sewer lines. Um, and they also help do some work for the city of Albuquerque um, on their storm, storm water um, lift stations as well. Um, planning and engineering, 5.5. Um, that staff works, you hear a lot about on the planning side of um, new services and engineering takes care of all the CIP projects that we, we run and they, they manage all those projects um, for the utility. Water resources, $4.7 million. Um, probably one of the most important groups. So they're all important, but this is um, looking towards the future um, for this utility and having the resources that we need. Power and chemicals is the big hitter, $21.2 million. Um, general government, 3.7. And interfund transfers of $116 million, which includes CIP and um, debt service. Future challenges, um, increased or conservation. Um, we had a rate increase last year to generate about 10 point, about $10 million. It looks like it's going to generate $7.5 million. Um, we'll do that on another presentation coming up. but. Increased conservation always has a challenge to our revenue stream. Um, reduce our system water loss, which I think we're doing a very good job with. Um, the increasing cost of power and chemicals, which is always good, it's going to inc always increase. Increase operating efficiencies um, to reduce operating expenses, which we talked about uh, briefly a little bit before. Improvements to the surface water plant, which we just kind of talked about. And finance and our asset management plan and investing in our infrastructure. Um, and we do a very good job, and we're a leader um, in, the, in, in, in this industry and in how much we invest in our infrastructure. Um, so, and we, again, we, we have a lot of debt, but we did some things that a lot of utilities haven't done yet that are going to have to do at some point in time. 
we have put that in our rear mirror and already taken care of that. So um, I would just say that we're in a very good financial position. And I'll turn it over to uh, Marta Ortiz, our asset manager manager, to go over the decade plan and CIP. And I stand for any questions if you have any before I sit down. We'll continue with the presentation. Good evening, Mr. Chair and, and board members. My name is Marta Ortiz. I'm the Asset Management Program Manager here at the Water Authority. And I'm going to be discussing the decade plan as well as the CIP portion of the budget. Um, the decade plan is a, a tool that we use to plan for our capital improvements projects. And they, we use it as a guide and a tool to prioritize CIP projects. Um, and we're going to be developing this on an annual basis. We previously have done that biannually, but in line with the budget document, we're going to do it, start doing it annually because the projects change so much. Um, this outlines the, um, in, in the decade plan, it outlines the basic rehab program, uh, some growth projects, special projects, and the Water One 2120 projects. Um, and then this document also is now linked to the budget as well as the finance plan. The next slide shows uh, historical trends of spending in the CIP budgets as well as what's future planned. The big spike from last year is ARPA funds and we had a big Intel project as well as a couple new projects that we got grant funding for. So that's why there's a spike there. Um, the CIP budget priorities are to finalize a grant strategy so we can start implementing grant applications for CIP projects. Uh, we're implementing a comprehensive asset management uh, report that guides us as well to dictate uh, the risk scores and condition of assets. And we're going to be using that as a tool to develop the decade plan along with the budget. Uh, and that'll be updated here at the end of the fiscal year, and it hasn't been updated since 2011. So we're, we're making great strides there. Uh, we're going to be developing uh, key performance in indicators from that plan, utilizing our software, and we're updating, uh, making, creating dashboards so we can use that data to, to make good decisions and sound decisions on prioritizing those infrastructure projects. Um, the, uh, we're going to be uh, improving our business processes, making sure that we're up to speed on getting depreciation in our software. Um, we're trying to use technology as best as we can to make those decisions as well to see what actually our assets are and are now worth based off of the age of those assets. Um, Stan mentioned the lead copper rule. We're implementing a, a service line inventory in our uh, database, as well as a renewal program. And then also we're going to try to expand our mobile solutions out in the field for the work order system. Other priorities, were uh, the resolution that's being presented uh, is in the amount of $103.5 million that will be appropriated for this next fiscal year. We're going to continue to use up those ARPA funds this next year. Uh, and get those projects underway and, and going. Um, some of the other projects include small diameter sewer and interceptor renewal. Stan mentioned that there's been a couple of collapse, so we're trying to get those renewed. Um, we're constructing a volcanoes cliff arsenic treatment facility and transmission line. Um, we're uh, doing an evaluation on all of our stranded assets that are out there and making some we're going to be making some decisions on what to do with those stranded assets, either put them back into place or, or make another decision for those assets. Um, Stan mentioned the sediment removal at the water plant. That's part of the funding, the additional funding that, that we're going to borrow for. Uh, lift station and vacuum station renewal electrical control panels. Um, we're moving forward on the Tahajali project. Um, should be starting here in July and August. Uh, and then we're going to continue to do water line renewal and groundwater asset renewal as well, which is in the decade plan. The next slide shows by category 
from the decade plan as well as in the resolution that's before you of each of the amounts, total amounts that will be uh, allocated in the budget for this next fiscal year. So a total of 103.5 million, 88.7 of that will be for the basic rehab program that we continue to make improvements on our existing infrastructure. Uh, Four million for growth projects. That includes information technology upgrades as well as development uh, UEC reimbursements. We, we fund that out of that. And then um, the special projects include 8.3, which is um, in the rate ordinance. We fund steel water line renewal and AMI infrastructure. And then thirdly is the mission site renewal. So um, that's in, in the additional funding that we're requesting. Uh, we're uh, borrowing for. And then lastly, 2.5 million for the water 2120 projects that we're starting. And that's all I have. Do you have any questions? Thank you so much. Any questions? Commissioner Barbola? Yes, um, it's on our website. The Water 2120 plan is on our website and it lists the various web uh, projects that are entailed for that. For um, the Bosque plant is one of them. Um, the um, uh, aquifer storage recovery, a new, another site for that. And conservation is a lot of that as well. So yeah, the Water 21 is on our website. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner. Anyone else? Uh, I do have one question for you on the capital side. Uh, is there anything in here on the Four Hills redundancy project? Has that been funded yet, or is that still in design, or like kind of where is that project? I'm not aware of that project. Mark, do you have a little more information? Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, we're currently working through that project in conjunction with the city of Albuquerque, so that's in the works. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not seeing any further questions here. I'm not sure if anybody wanted to jump back to the um, budget side, since this is kind of the, the CIP end of the, of the two presentations. So are there any other questions for uh, Mr. Alred? OK. Uh, I just did have one comment. I just wanted to say that, that uh, I certainly appreciate the fact that we're doing more with less this year uh, in the face of, of so many other entities raising rates, raising prices, that kind of thing, that, that we're able to do this without a rate increase uh, and still get our employees a uh, compensation increase that's in line with basically what we've done at the county and, and our partners at the city have done. So uh, it's certainly not enough, I think, to keep up with, with uh, what we know the actual inflation rate is. But I think in, in the face of the trade-off of having to do a rate increase, it, it makes sense. And I think it still shows our employees that they're valued and hopefully we can and to continue to evaluate that in the future and make sure that we're able to recruit and retain the, the best employees and the great employees that we have, keep them. So, um, yes, Commissioner Barboa. I just, again, thanks for bringing back up the, on page 13 of it. I, maybe I just need to speak offline, but improvements to the surface water treatment plant is one of the future challenges identified. Is that because we, Sorry if I'm behind, but just is that that that's maybe that's already been talked about as the treatment plant, or or is in that relation to Kirtland Air Force Base? I guess I'm just tying maybe my own assumption. Uh, Commissioner Balbo and uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm talking about this. We're, that slide's talking about the surface water treatment plant, which is in the Renaissance area by off of Mission by um, was it um, Cos. Costco and Sam's Club. That plant is now 15 years old. It's not, it's new, but it's not that new. It's, it's, it's has issues that we have to address. Um, so there will be challenges of starting to do rehab on that facility. We had not really had to do a lot of rehab per se. We have, but um, major rehab on that. But it, it's, 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 it's coming due. All right, not seeing any other questions here. So 
Uh, we'll move these one at a time, correct? So item B, which is uh, our operating budget, I'll make a motion to approve. We have a second from uh, Councillor Davis. Any further discussion on the budget? Seeing none, all in favor, please uh, raise your hand to signify approval. And seeing all hands up, so we have a unanimous passage of the budget. That takes us to item C then, which is the capital budget, uh, R23-11. Do I have a motion? A motion from Commissioner Baca, second from Member Real. Any further discussion on the capital plan? Seeing none, uh, all in favor, uh, please raise your hand. Seeing none opposed, the item passes unanimously. And that takes us to item D, R23-12, declaring that the well site at Descanso Southeast and the San Jose Drain surplus property and shall be sold. And we have Mr. Charles Colbert to present. Mr. Chairman, members of the board. <clears throat> Is this on? I can't tell. No? Maybe closer. Is it better? Okay. I, I never need a, a, a microphone anyway. Um, this is a small uh, piece of property in, in the uh, South Broadway area that was originally acquired a long time ago for a well site. It was never used for that. It has been uh, sitting uh, idle for uh, quite a few decades. There's no reason for us to keep it. It's not, there's no anticipated operational need for the lot. Anytime real estate is declared surplus and sold, uh, we have to bring it to the board and uh, it will be sold for appraised value. That's how we are allowed to dispose of property. So it has been appraised and will be um, sold. And that's, I am open to any questions if you have them. Thank you, Mr. Colbert. Uh, Commissioner Barboa. Sorry, I'm just trying to find, do we have a, like you said South Broadway area, could you expand the location? I, I apologize. I, it, it appears I didn't uh, um, attach a map um, it is on the San Jose drain, and um, this is, is slightly north of Rio Bravo um, and in that general area. But I'm uh, not sure I, without the map that I should say much more than that. I apologize. That's okay. I was just interested. And so um, you're saying it'll just go up, revenues from that will come back to Water Utility Authority. Correct. The, the revenues will be put into the capital projects. Uh, I don't anticipate it will um, go for very much. It's uh, not even a, most of our well sites are not full residential lot size. I, I believe this one is about, um, yeah, it's, it's less than a quarter of an acre. Mm. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Barboa. Any other Questions on this one? Yes, Councilor, uh, Vice Chair Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. I, um, I just wanted to say, I, I think we had, the last time we sold land, we put a proviso on there about affordable housing. I did check on this one. It's too small to be of any use, so I, I think that's what you were thinking of, and it is too small, so just wanted to make sure that was clear. <laughs> one tiny home would be appropriate for this size lot, yes. And I apologize for not uh, including a map, and I will make sure if I bring another surplus property to you, I will bring you a map. <laughs> we appreciate that. Uh, anything further up here? I move approval. We have a motion to approve, and a second from the vice chair. Seeing no further discussion, uh, all in favor, please raise your hand. And uh, any opposed? Was, uh, Member Rail, was that opposed? Oh, okay. That was uh, unanimous then. Uh, and we take us, that takes us to uh, item E, C-2311 FY 2023, third quarter operating financial reports. Mr. Elrod. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, this is our third quarter um, financial results. Um, total revenues are about $5 million um, above last year. Uh, we did have a 5% rate increase that went in effect this year, um, projecting about $2.5 million short on what we thought revenue would be with the rate increase, um, but we are still in a good position um, to cover that. And there'll be other 
slides in the, well, later on in the presentation to kind of explain why that happened. Um, the next slide is year to date operating expenses. Um, the big increase from FY23 to from FY22 was an increase in the um, transfers to debt service, which was um, very minimal. Uh, we are projected to be below the revised budget amounts. Um, so we are um, well on our way to be um, at or under what was been appropriated for the fiscal year. Next slide. Um, this is a quick um, picture of operating expenses by month compared to estimate. Um, the huge spike in July is that's when we make our debt service payments. So um, we're one part of it, so um, it's always higher, but um, we straight line the rest of our um, expenses and then compare it to what we actually spent. Um, and as, as usual, we're primarily under underspent. On the next slide, for days cash on hand, even though it looks low in FY23, there's still 420 days of cash on hand, which is outstanding. So um, we are looking very good in that realm. Um, the next slide is our year-to-day capital expenses. Um, we started a lot of projects in FY22, and we began completing a lot of those projects in FY23. Um, you always kind of see this increase and decrease, but these projects take multiple years to um, start and finish. Um, a lot of work this year with interceptors and special projects. Um, the yellow line for the growth, we are um, one of the things, it's a lot of our IT projects, but we are um, redoing our SCADA system, which controls our wastewater and our water systems and moves water and sewer and lift stations and whatnot. So we are upgrading um, that whole thing over a five-year time span. Um, our debt coverage ratio, um, our senior subordinate lien, um, our, our um, covenant is 1.2. As you can see with the orange box, we are well below, well above the 1.2. Our senior lien um, covenants is 1.33, and we maintain um, well above that as well. Um, so um, we're looking good on that ratio. Water use production, you can kind of see in FY23 is been our lowest year in the last five in production. And on the next slide, the same thing with consumption. So um, as, as um, the drought has increased, we have um, produced less water and we have sold less water. Um, so the reaction from the public has been very favorable. Um, again, it does have an effect on, re on revenue, but we have things in place to um, take care of that. Um, the next slide, precipitation versus production. Um, we've had a lot of rain at the end of FY22 up through uh, March of um, 23, and you can kind of see that. And that also probably has a driving factor in our um, uh, production and consumption levels. Um, but we're, we're, look, we're looking um, great at the end of the third quarter. And I stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Elrod. Seeing any questions from the board? Not seeing any. Uh, I believe this will be, I'll make a motion for receipt be noted on this item. Second from Councillor Davis. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hands. Seeing none opposed, the item passes unanimously. That takes us to item FC2312, FY23 third quarter performance indicator report. Good to see you again, Ms. Henderson. Go ahead. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, this is a, a performance indicator report. We give this to the board quarterly. It is a snapshot of utility performance. Um, the scorecard indicators are categorized by levels of service. And um, this, the, this different areas that we look at are um, based on benchmarking and performance assessments that we use to identify gaps in our, in our service. 
um, and establish targets to address those performance gaps. So the scorecard uh, indicator targets, they're linked to our performance benchmarking that we do. They're also linked to the goals and objectives that I've presented to you before. Um, the results of our cu customer opinion survey and our effective utility management process. So this is just, you know, those documents are hundreds of pages long. This is one concise snapshot that we can give you um, quarterly to show you how we're doing with respect to all those different areas. Um, the, the one area that we have not met our target in this year, unfortunately, is the injury time, um, where we've exceeded the 2,500 hours. Um, I do have to note, though, that 2,500 is extremely low. The ind industry average is far higher than that. So we've, um, we've been able to reduce our injury hours over the last 15 years significantly, and we strive to maintain that, that low number. Um, so everyone is, is healthy. Um, we've just had a, a few more incidents than, than, um, than we were hoping to have. So um, we'd never hoped to have any. But, um, and then there, um, in general, everything is looking good. There's three areas that are a work in progress. Um, and of course, they're a work in progress. So I stand for any questions. I'm not seeing any questions at the moment up here. Um, I did have one, but I think I answered it as you were talking. So. Uh, the reason that these numbers in the first column don't always match up with what the target is, but they're still on track, is because this is uh, through the quarter. It's not for the full year, and the goal is set for the full year. Is that correct? correct right? Yeah. Okay. So we're projecting where we will be by the end of the year. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank I you. understand then. So that, that makes sense. Uh, I'll make a motion for receipt be noted on this indicator report. A second from Commissioner Baca. See no further discussion. All in favor, please raise your hand. Uh, passes unanimously. Thank you. And that takes us to our final business item here, item G, C23-13, a memorandum of understanding between the City of Albuquerque and the Aquatic Conservation Facility and the Water Authority. Mr. Kelly, thank you. Uh, hello, Mr. Chair and members of the board. I'm Mark Kelly. I am the Water Resources Division Manager. And um, this evening, uh, I'm here to present uh, an MOU that we have with the city that really looks into um, preserving an endangered species in the middle Rio Grande, the Rio Grande Silvery Minnow. Um, the Silvery Minnow has been an endangered species since it was listed by Fish and Wildlife Service in uh, 1993. Right now, it's only occupying about 7% uh, of its historic range. And the Fish and Wildlife Service has a, a goal to bring it back. The ultimate goal is to get it uh, delisted, as they say. And the Water Authority helps out with that. Um, we work with the city uh, aquatic conservation facility to rear uh, small little silvery minnows and uh, release them into the Rio Grande to supplement the native population. And we also participate in the Middle Rio Grande Endangered Species Collaborative Program uh, that supports um, conservation efforts for all of the endangered species in the Middle Rio Grande, including the silvery minnow, the yellow-billed cuckoo, uh, the Pecos sunflower, and the, the meadow jumping mouse. So one of the ways that we support the minnow in particular is through um, the conservation facility at the biopark. Um, it's one of only three in the state uh, that uh, rear silvery minnow. Um, and they, um, they, they collect the eggs from the uh, river and then they, they spawn them and they grow them up. They actually tag little tiny little tags so they can track them later on onto the fish, uh, and then they release them uh, into the Rio Grande. Um, the collaborative program that I mentioned earlier is something that we've been doing since 2004. Um, it really focuses on you know, things like habitat restoration, monitoring for silvery minnows, um, monitoring how silvery minnow rescue is going during drying events. And um, we, the collaborative program is, is really all about um, a science-based program, finding out 
what are the best things to do to try and help preserve the silvery minnow and increase populations. Uh, we have different um, agencies that participate in the collaborative program, uh, like the Interstate Stream Commission from the state. Uh, MRGCD is a, a big contributor. Um, there's various Pueblos involved as well. But um, it's using the collective knowledge to try and make things better uh, for the minnow in the long run. And there's um, federal partners like the Bureau of Reclamation, the Army Corps of Engineers in the collaborative program. So there's like a, a federal side of the program and a non-federal side. Um, and there's two co-chairs of the collaborative program. I myself am the non-federal co-chair uh, of the, of the uh, Endangered Species Collaborative Program. So uh, we've got this MOU before you. It's an extension of what we've already had for, for many years um, since 2004 with the Aquatic Conservation Facility. Um, the MOU is for another 10 years. Um, we've done some great work so far, released almost a million silvery minnows in, into the uh, wild in those uh, 18 years since we started. And uh, moving forward, the MOU says that, that the city will, will rear uh, between 10,000 and uh, 50,000 silvery minnows annually, maintain their facility, uh, release them into the Rio Grande, and then uh, report uh, to us uh, the effects. And um, the cost for this is $165,000 per year. That's already been taken into account in the Water Resources Division budget uh, and is uh, about what we're spending uh, in these last uh, few years as well. So with that, I will uh, stand for any questions. Commissioner Baca. Another question. I just I want to move approval of this, and I want to uh, commend you all for continuing on this partnership. Very important to protect our endangered species in the Middle Valley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And a second from Councillor Feeblecorn. Any questions or comments on this? Yes, Member Real. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to let um, the public know and our city councilors that those tags are the one Albuquerque tags that go on each of those. <laughs> I have no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> and then it says, if Tom, please return to the city of Albuquerque. <laughs> the other question I was just going to ask, um, so who, who does the counting of the number of produced animals? Uh, they, they count them there at the, um, the ACF, the, the Aquatic Conservation Facility. Um, they have uh, a staff down there that, that do this, so the bio, dedicated biopark staff. I'm just kidding. I suspect <laughs> someone's counting. They're pretty small. Yeah, you know, they've got to have good time. eyes. I guess the real sort of substantive question I, I did have, Mr. Chairman, is so in, in the analysis of, of this program, because this program was, has been around for some time, um, obviously, my, my, my assumption is that it's, it's been successful. Um, obviously, it depends on the amount of water in the Rio Grande and, and that sort of issue. Um, where is the species as it relates to its list uh, or its, has it moved up as it relates to the, the list of endangered species or will it perpetually be on that list and this is just the realities of our, of our ecosystem in, in this area of the state? Um, Mr. Chair, I remember uh, it is still very much an endangered species and has not moved up to above endangered is threatened um, and it it hasn't gotten close to being uh, listed as, as threatened. Uh, the minnow is definitely in need of help and things like the uh, ACF really do help it. I think if, if, if uh, hatcheries like this didn't exist, we likely would have not no silvery minnow uh, out there, uh, you know, in the wild. So I think this is a really important uh, thing to keep them going. But the silvery minnow is is not really rebounding. It's it's doing bad. Yes, Commissioner Barbo. Well, that was t I think that was sort of my question. 1993. That's 30 years now, and we're at to seven percent. Do you know where we? Start. I think that's what your presentation said, right? Like 7% Se of it. 7%, um, uh, Commissioner Barbaro and, and Mr. Chair, 7% uh, 
is is where the um, the current uh, range is of of the historical range, and they're looking to introduce uh, two more uh, ranges within that. Um, but um, we're still that that number is, is stayed pretty much uh, the same. I think if anything, we're treading water. Okay, we're yeah. just sort of hopefully maintaining. Yeah. And I guess I, this might be unrelated, but I was I was 30 years ago as sort of a young person, and I remember that the controversy around the Montano Bridge was all around the Silvery Minnow, and the opposition to expanding it was because it would in, further endanger the Silvery Minnow. Is that, I, and I think there's expansion of the Montano Bridge, right, that being proposed, I mean, I guess is the water utility and, and this effort, that might have just been community's way to try and get the Montano Bridge to not be expanded, but. Uh, uh, Commissioner Burble and, and Chair, <laughs> um, this, uh, this refugium <coughs> has had nothing to do with the, the Montano Bridge um, or, or anything like that, it really has, more to do with us being, um, you know, trying to be good stewards of the river as we started using the river for our um, our drinking water project uh, to to be, you know, making sure that we're not harming any silvery minnows and we're actually doing a, a net positive for the silvery minnow. Yes, Member Rail. And, and Commissioner Barbeau, just just for. For a truth in uh, in democracy here, uh, Mark Sanchez and I were both five years old at the time, <laughs> <laughs> working for the city when this when Montano Bridge was uh, part of the conversation, and it really was more about um, endangered species and or about uh, fish and wildlife concern about the impacts of a of a bridge over a, a river facility, and as uh, Mr. Kelly just described, it was really much more once the city started having the conversations about drying down water from the Rio Grande and, and also the fact that as you pump water from the groundwater, you've got to make sure you're put, putting back water into the, into the river. And, and so it, it sort of was a bit of a different issue, but nonetheless, it, um, it became a, a challenge for both the city and now the city and the county authority. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further here? I just wanted to commend the effort um, kind of dovetailing on the, on the points that have been made. Unfortunately, it's kind of a, you know, it, it seems like a, a futile exercise, but I think it really emphasizes the point for the, the need for collaboration between all of the entities that use Rio Grande water because I, I know that last year was an incredibly challenging year for the minnow because of the low flows and, you know, drying in the middle valley. This year, I suspect, will be very different, but uh, it's very hard for, for this kind of species to adapt to that kind of rapid variation and change year to year. So we, we need more consistent flows, which uh, we, we can't guarantee with, with Mother Nature and, and even more so with climate change. So I think it speaks to the need for, for further collaboration with all of the users and trying to keep some stable flow there for, for these and other species that rely on that as well. So. Uh, I'll go ahead and call for a vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. Seeing none opposed, the item carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Thank you. So we're on to item 10, our other business, and we're going to reorganize this just a little bit. We're going to take item 10B first, which is a presentation on our customer assistance programs. And we have Ms. Candelaria back again to present. All right, good evening again, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, this is a presentation that I've given in the past, but many of you are new, so it would be really helpful for you to understand what kind of assistance programs customer service offers. So um, I've got about eight slides here, and you won't be surprised to know that COVID really did a number on many of our customers and their ability to stay current on their bills. Um, we had a large number of customers who were just not able to pay at all. And the Water Authority's response to that in terms of COVID was to suspend all kinds of disconnections, regardless of the reason. We also didn't charge any late fees for two years. But of course, as we came out of the pandemic, we were faced with the challenge of how do we address getting back into our normal billing practices and not just start turning everybody off with these large balances. So through our customer conversations in the fall of 2021, we were able to communicate with customers about what's the best approach to use. 
So in a nutshell, what we determined was that we could offer at the Water Authority a variety of things. Some of them are going to be federally funded. Some are uh, funded through the Water Authority and our customers. But another is a tool that we use through our billing system called payment arrangements. So I'm going to give you some details about that and let you know how helpful that's been to our customers. And essentially, at the end of our customer conversations in November, what we learned was we needed to take a really uh, comprehensive and compassionate approach in dealing with our customers. So we spent a lot of time communicating with them, letting them know via the mail that we were going to resume our billing operations and that they needed to reach out to us. All that information is available on our website as well. We started off by sending warning letters, saying we really want to talk to you. Please call us. Let us help you get um, current on your bill. Um, and what we did is we started with the highest balance customers and started working our way down. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about these payment arrangements. Essentially, what we do is we offer no interest, no down payment, ways to pay your bill back. And depending on how much you you're owe, your balance, we can go 12, 24, even 36 months. We basically set up a nice spreadsheet, and we talk through this with the customer over the phone. We use an electronic agreement that we exchange over email, so you don't even have to come into the office. That was another thing we were trying to make it just not a convenient, but you know, in the beginning stages, some people were really apprehensive about coming into offices. So um, to date, we've set up over 3,100 payment arrangements for customers. And what's nice is the payment arrangement actually shows up on their bill, so they know exactly what they need to repay for the past debt, and it also lists their current charges, so they see right there what they need to pay. I'm sure you're probably all familiar with emergency rental assistance funding. That was a um, federally funded program that was filtered down to the states and then to local governments. Um, at the Water Authority, uh, we were able to actually process applications. The state called us a, a bulk processor. So we could have, we had an application on our website that you could complete. We confirmed essentially what the past due balance was to the state. We shipped that information up to them electronically. And in return, we would get a bulk payment that we would apply then to those accounts that were on that list. So let me take a look at that figure real quick. Um, we, we awarded over 1,600 uh, ERAP funds, totaling about a million dollars to customers just here at the Water Authority. The other federally funded program is the Low Income Household Water Assistance Program. It's a mouthful. It's really the companion to the LIHEAP, with the heating program. Um, and what this did is it gave both renters and homeowners, uh, again, assistance. It's one time for catching up on their water bill. The difference with the ERAP is ERAP was just available to renters. But this LIWAP uh, was available to renters and owners. So uh, we had 2,800 and change customers that were eligible, excuse me, received funding through the LIWAP, totaling almost a million dollars there. Um, I mentioned earlier that you could go to our website for that kind of information and even to apply. So this is just a little screenshot. That green circle in the lower left, you click that, it takes you to another page. You can see the information. You can access the applications. So in addition to those federally funded programs, the Water Authority funds uh, what we call the WAF, Water Assistance Fund. If you're familiar at all with PNM's Good Neighbor Fund, it operates in a very similar manner. This is one-time assistance for folks who get behind. They might have had a medical bill that kind of wiped out their you know, budget for the month. Um, and we partner with a couple of local food banks, the Rio Grande Food Project and uh, the Storehouse. And they help screen customers and basically award those funds. We apply it directly to their bill. During COVID, we increased that funding, that one-time funding, to $250 per customer. Uh, prior to COVID, it was at $150. And during some of our special events where we um, participate with PNM when they host their community assistance fair, we've even gone as high as 300 if we then are able to qualify that customer for our low-income credit program. Which takes me to the next slide, low-income credit program. And I touched on this briefly during the presentation about the ordinance. Um, this is ongoing assistance. So every single month, if you qualify for this program, you get a credit on your bill for water, a credit on your bill for sewer, and the city of Albuquerque provides you a credit of $2 uh, towards your uh, trash bill. So, and again, this uh, credit amount is going up for water and sewer to, to $27.77 beginning in July. Um, so it's an annual, uh, basically you apply, you know, at any time during the year and you get 12 months of credit. We do require that 
you be the homeowner and the occupant because we really want to be judicious about making sure that the beneficiaries of this credit are the owner occupant of the home not, not because we can't guarantee for example that like a a renter property manager is going to pass on those those savings so um, right now, and I realized I went back and watched, watched the video from last meeting. I said we had 120. I was completely wrong. I don't know where I got that number. Maybe I was nervous. We have 820. 820. So I apologize for providing you that wrong information. Um, our goal is to get 1,000, and we've recently been having some good conversations with our two partner agencies about how we can do additional outreach, talking about where else we can you know, look, whether that's resources through the city of Albuquerque. Kirky Community Centers, APS, the 505 Clothing Bank, you know, who, who do we all know that are customers that might need help? Because some people, when they're searching for food assistance, that's all they're focused on right at the time, and they're either not interested or don't want to hear about, you know, other programs. So I just want to assure you that we're looking at ways to expand that program, too, because we know there's more people out there who need help. And I mentioned earlier that we have partner agencies. Um, there's little pictures here of them. Um, in 2019 and 2022, one of the kind of most um, invigorating events that we participate in is led by PNM, and they call it their Community Assistance Fair. Um, and we're able to touch base with um, customers that um, show up for PNM and clothing and food and you, you name it, any kind of assistance that's available. And in 2022, um, we were able to award over $27,000 in assistance to customers through both the WAF and the low income credit. So we take our laptops and we set up shop, and we qualify customers on the spot, we're able to access their accounts. So it's a very rewarding experience for everyone. <clears throat> so that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about any of these programs. Any questions? Commissioner Barboa. I just wanted to know, and I think last time I might be asked a similar question, but these are lots of great programs for assistance. Do they all have this sort of same requirement of level of income or well, vary? So for the WAF, the Water Assistance Fund, there isn't an income requirement. You basically say, I have this need because this happened to me. I gave the example of having like a high medical bill that kind of wiped you out for the month. So it's really not income-based, the Water Assistance Fund. Definitely the low-income credit program that the Water Authority runs, that is income-based. I think we had a brief conversation at the last meeting trying to figure out is it 150 percent of the median income the answer to that's yes um, then the two federally funded programs the emergency rental assistance that is because part of the requirement was that you had to you know provide evidence of what your income was and the same would be true for the lie wap the low income water assistance it's also income based and the payment arrangement has nothing to do with your income it just you need help dividing up your past debt over some months, and we set that up. Thank you. And yeah. one more thing, Tara, if I may. Um, the, uh, I'm just interested in learning. Like, I, when I've been a renter, I've never been required to pay water. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to me if I don't know if that's even a housing requirement or how that actually happens for renters. Yeah. Um, what I can tell you is that because the Water Authority is property based, the meter uh, and the account are really just set up in the name of you know, owner, occupant, that kind of thing. So we don't know whether the renter is paying the bill or the owner. That really just comes down to those two private parties and through the arrangements they have in their lease, right? Um, so when it comes to awarding assistance, let's say WAF, you could be a renter or a homeowner. You just have to show evidence that you have a past due bill and that you've run into a, you know, a short-term financial hardship. Um, but some of the other programs, like the ERAP, you got to show that you're the renter. Um, I honestly, since I, we didn't do the screening, we kind of did the supportive information about here's the past due bill. The state was responsible for screening the applicants. And basically, I think what they had to do is certify uh, or through an affidavit, I'm the renter and this is what I pay and I'm responsible for the water bill. Thank you. Good, good question. I, I had that same little light bulb go off in my mind when, when you're talking yeah. about renters assistance. Anything else up here? Not seeing any. Thank you so much okay. for coming to us with this uh, important information. I think we're all better educated for it. So appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, item A is OB 2310. This is our 2022 con consumer confidence report. And we have Danielle Shurin here. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Danielle Sharon. I'm the Compliance Division Manager for the Water Authority. 
And I'm presenting today on the Consumer Confidence Report. I left a copy um, in, at your desk. You should all have a copy. These are just hitting the um, customers' mailboxes the end of last week and early this week. Um, this Consumer Confidence Report is our annual drinking water quality report. And we send it to, to our customers every year after we publish it. It's required by the EPA. And the main goal is public notification to convey water quality information that everybody can understand. Um, the water quality program in our compliance division collects samples, manages data, produces the report. Um, they also um, answer water quality customer calls and have an email address that we um, correspond with customers that have questions on the report or any water quality questions at all. And it's also available online. Why do we have this water quality report each year? Well, initially it's required by the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, as I said, it is a public notice. So it's, it's information that we are required to provide to our customers on the quality of water that we provide. Um, it's important to show customers what contaminants were detected in the previous year. So this is a, a report on 22, 2022 calendar year. And also show how what was detected compares with water quality standards, federal and state water quality standards. Um, sending this out every year also provides just routine basic education on uh, our drinking water quality and where water comes from. A lot of the information in this report is required by the EPA. So I'll go through some of those things. Um, water system information, how do they, can they get a hold of us, whether it's billing or water quality or development, there has to be easy access to us um, and make that prevalent. Uh, customers need to understand what their sources of water are and where our water comes from. Um, we have both 65 groundwater wells that are active and um, the surface water plant that treats water from the Rio Grande. There's also a lot of standard definitions. Um, when you're talking about water quality, it's a lot of regulatory and technical language, so we want to make sure that is the same for actually utilities nationwide. So a lot of that, those definitions are um, EPA defined. <clears throat> More required information is the detected contaminants from the year before. And so these are contaminants that are detected um, from compliance monitoring. So that's required monitoring from the state. And they give us schedules for that. And they actually come out and collect those samples for us. So they'll collect it from entry points. And that's where we have sources of water, different wells where they enter the distribution system. So it's after that water is treated, but before our first customer. So that's where we collect those samples to make sure we understand the quality of the water that's being served to all the customers. We have sample points throughout the distribution system um, at homes, businesses, and we also have uh, water sample hydrants on the, on the side of the road that we collect samples from. And then the surface water treatment plant is a little bit more um, complex treatment, so that requires more frequent monitoring as well. And all of this is included in the report each year. Um, I have a couple other slides to explain these other ones. So um, other drinking water regulations and required educational information as well. As I mentioned, the definitions are pretty technical. Um, we like to have the same ones in there every year and use the same language. So it's, it's comfortable and repetitive and people understand it. And um, these are very small um, units that we're looking at. So it's important to explain the different units and, and how small that is. So for example, um, and here you can see a part per billion, which we use frequently, is a, a drop of water in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. So it's a very small amount. We have to be consistent with that. All right, so this, the main page is the contaminants that we've detected. We make it very clear that it's safe to drink. All, everything that we've detected is below um, water quality standards. Um, <clears throat> like I said, also, this is only the compliance monitoring. So we collect much more samples that are reported in this report. Um, we collect process samples um, in all different parts of treatment plants and throughout the system, and also throughout the distribution, to, just to make sure everything is working as expected. Um, over 5,000 samples a year we collect. We collect samples every day. Um, 
So if something was not collected for compliance in 2022, you may see some things in here with older dates, and that's just because it wasn't collected last year. So if there's something significant of compliance here that is an older date, it just hasn't been collected more recently than that. Um, and enemy, the Nexo Environment Department uh, holds and maintains all this data as well. <clears throat> so there's some other rules that we also have to report on. Um, the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule is one of them. This is a rule where EPA collects data on contaminants that are not yet regulated, but they want in more information to understand if they should be regulated. So the last time we um, collected these samples was the fourth unregulated contaminant monitoring rule, and that was 2019 to 2020. So we have to keep publishing those results until we collect the, the next set, and that'll be in 2024. So next year we'll have a new set of data. Um, that's all on that page. Educational language that's required by the EPA. Um, so these are very common questions that people have on their drinking water. Um, lead is a very common concern. Um, arsenic is a common concern. It's a natural contaminant, excuse me, that we um, do find in our region. So we do treat for arsenic. Um, there's a lot of questions on that. Sodium is, is not very common, but um, certain people with different health issues have concerns about that. So we like to make sure all that is reported. We also have to provide an EPA hotline as well, if someone would like a EPA phone number to call for more information. There's a lot of op optional information that we supplement. Um, one exciting one is the awards. We work very hard to produce great water every year. Um, so in 2022, some of the awards that we received were um, five-year director's award distribution and sister system operations from the AWWA, and um, also government finance officers association award, the Ding distinguished Bud budget presentation award in 2022 as well. Um, 2021, we also got some treat water treatment awards. So we like to keep those in and make people understand uh, how hard we work at producing good quality water. Um, we also offer free lead testing for all our customers. So that's something we put in this report. Um, go to the next slide. We had 39 requests from customers last year, or in 2022, um, for lead. And this is just they can put it, send us their email, uh, send us an email or call and request a, a sample. Um, lead samples are a little bit different because they have to be you let the water sit in your pipes overnight and you have to take it like a, it's called a first draw sample in the morning. So we typically have to just work with the customers, give them a sample kit, educate them, and then go pick it up when they filled it up. So there's a lot of customer interaction um, and education throughout that process. So as, as was mentioned in previous presentations, there's some new regulations coming out on lead that makes us offer even more testing and complete a lead service line inventory. So we're preparing for all those rules to go into place in 2024. And that covers the basic content of the report. Um, like I said, it's available online in English and in Spanish. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Commissioner Baca? I just have a question of what that um, aerial photo is. Of. Is that at the Alameda? What, where is that? Yeah, that's the intake. OK. Mm -hmm. Amazing picture. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Yes, absolutely. Member Riel, and then uh, Councillor Fee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and my compliments to you and to the staff that puts together. This is a nice report. I have one um, just maybe you request. Sure. I just read the uh, portion here that says in Espanol, and then you actually have to call to get a copy of the report if you want one in Spanish. So my question to you is, what would keep us from having this report in two languages so that folks can actually see it when it comes, I'm assuming this gets distributed to their water bill or just email, whatever the case might be, as opposed to having to ask for a special report, which a lot of folks may get this at home and may, if they're not, if they're not gonna read it or if they don't read English and they need to get information, they may never have the time to actually call for a report. So 
And that may be just, and, that, and the question also may be expanded to, is Spanish the only other language that the report's available? Member Al, um, Mr. Chair, yes. Um, Spanish is the only other language that we offer it in, and it is posted online. Um, I would say cost maybe would have been an initial prohibition, but I think we could definitely consider mailing out a Spanish version if that's what the board would like. I, th I think it would be a great, um, you know, obviously this goes to everybody. <laughs> we all drink it, right? Yep. And, and I think it is um, a way to connect with um, our community in a, in a much more direct manner. But I will also say, look, this little report here saved my, uh, my bacon a couple of times uh, in the past with my daughter's uh, science work where I could go and get some quick information on the water quality. <laughs> so uh, Mr. Sanchez Jr. and your group, thanks for getting her through science. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anything further here, Mr. Barboa? Or I'm sorry, Councilor Tubalcorn, you, you had asked. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was actually going to ask about the additional languages, so my question was answered. But I would say that it's a conversation that we've had a lot at Council recently on, on all kinds of notices that are going out to citizens, and we do have more than those two languages, so something to think about for the future. Commissioner uh, Barbour. I had, I, I, you said that when people want their, that people have called to request for lead testing. Mm -hmm. Is that the only testing? And how do people reach or know that they can ask for water testing? Sure. Um, I'm trying to think of the last time we had a, I think we've had a couple of bill inserts about it. There, but it is essentially uh, on our website. We have um, a hotline, a water quality hotline, where they can typically call. We get, we get a lot of calls. Um, and then there's an online form that they can fill out through our website. So it is. Um, but someone would have to look for it a little bit on our website, I would say. And then when somebody requests um, a water testing, how, like, how long does that usually take? Well, we'll get them with the bottles within the week. So within the same week, we can take them with the bottles. The results from the lab take two to three weeks to come back. Yeah. Anything else here? Good questions. Um, I, I've got, seen this report for years and years. And uh, it's great to kind of get the inside scoop for where this is coming from, why it's required, and what it all means. And it's really impressive that, that we put this all together and that we have um, some really good water, which is you know, something we can be proud of as a community. And I guess I have two questions on that, though. Uh, so you mentioned a water sampling hydrant. Mm -hmm. So that's separate from a fire hydrant. This is something Mr. Unique. Chair, yes. Um, these, you'll see them, they're off the main line similarly, you'll find them on the sidewalk, but they're green and you open them up and there's a little spout on the side. It's, uh, it lets us make sure the spout stays clean and doesn't freeze um, so that we can have a little bit more quality control on our samples. I've seen those, I know which ones you're talking about. <laughs> um, and then secondly here, uh, because there's, we've, we've heard a lot about Kirtland recently and, and the, the leak out there and that sort of thing, and I realize that that's, you know, concentrated in one region of the city, but of course we move water around and, and that sort of thing. Um, I guess the, it's sort of a question, but not really. We, we haven't detected that in our drinking water wells, hence it's not reported anywhere in, in any kind of document like this. Mr. Chair, that is correct. We have not detected it, so it does not have to be reported. Okay. And then the last one is the distinction on lead in our service lines versus lead in a household. So, if you test at someone's house and they, you know, you find a high concentration of lead, how do you then sort of uh, dive into that case and, and figure out is it their household plumbing or is it service line in the water authority's jurisdiction? Mr. Chair, thank you for the question. Um, as as Marta stated earlier in our capital improvement program or asset management program, we are working on a lead service line inventory, so that includes our side, which we're, we're tackling first. So understanding where we have lead lines, if we do, um, is a key aspect of, of understanding that problem. Um, it could be a combination of things. It could be our side of the service line, it could be a private side of the lead service line, or it could be fixtures in the house. So essentially, um, we haven't had any customers with that sort of a, a significant problem, 
but if we did, we would keep sampling. And there's ways that you can sample um, differently. So I, I mentioned the first draw. That's the first sample in the morning. You can take, keep taking liters, and that kind of represents um, back into the pipes of the house. So if you, you collect one liter, you collect all the way through five liters, they say that that represents out into the service line. So there's ways that you can, can um, collect samples in technical ways that will help show an indication of whether it's in the house or in the line. Um, if it's our, our service line, obviously we would replace it. And so that would be continuous monitoring after you make changes. So you, you fix one of those things and then you keep monitoring um, until, until you find that the problem is gone. Great, I think that's really helpful. Member Rail. And Commissioner Olivas, um, and I would attest to the uh, process. Uh, we had recently an experience with a, a, um, a company here in town or a, a uh, retailer here in town that um, we detected some lead in the water and the water authority went out, did the, exactly what she described, and determined that the actual fixtures in the, in the commercial portion of the building were the problem and not the, the water coming out of the system, which really gave us um, a, a good information and that once those were replaced, uh, and it was an, a, a possible acquisition of land by the city, and it sort of read, you know, raised a red flag right away for the city as this area contaminated, and, and it was through their work that we were able to not only get the business operating appropriately, but also making a good decision about whether or not we were going to purchase the property. So thank you so much for the work you guys did. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Anything else? Not seeing any. I really appreciate your report and your time tonight. Thank you so much for informing us on this. Thank you. Takes us to our last item, item C, OB 23-12. Uh, a water update from Mr. Kelly. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the board, um, I'm back. I'm Mark Kelly again. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, our water update. Uh, when we look at the drought monitor, 100% uh, of Bernalillo County is uh, in yellow, which means uh, abnormally dry. Um, and the drought severity coverage index for the county is currently at 100. Uh, when we look into the uh, what NOAA is expecting uh, seasonally. Uh, we uh, have a little bit of yellow in the, um, the middle Rio Grande uh, indicating drought development likely. When we look at the snowpack uh, in the mountains of New Mexico and southern Colorado, uh, this are, things are still looking really good there um, as of about a week or two ago, 163% in the San Juans uh, and 138% in the Northern Rio Grande. These graphs uh, give you a representation of how the snowpack has looked this year, which is the, um, the black line uh, in both these graphs. And then last year is the light blue line and then the the, the green line is the uh, average. So we are quite above average at the top in the San Juan watershed uh, and as well as in the Rio Grande below. And if you'll notice, uh, both, both watersheds are kind of having a, a late peak, as we call it this year. So the snow is staying around a little bit longer. And these are measuring in um, snow water equivalent. So when we look at our um, drought plan, uh, we look at various triggers. Um, the first trigger that we look at is that DSCI, um, and that uh, is 100 right now. In the drought plan, uh, to go into a drought advisory, the DSCI for Bernalillo County needs to be over 300. So you'll notice that I have circled here uh, drought advisory. We're in a, a no status for that. And then we also look into the criteria of um, uh, groundwater production as a percentage of the annual production goal. Uh, right now, 
We're at 118% of our groundwater pumping as a uh, part of the, as compared to our goal. And we also look at GPCD. And right now, uh, our GPCD is 123, which is much lower than our, our next goal, uh, which is 135 by 2024. Um, so when we look at uh, these conditions are for triggers uh, for drought, we are, are not uh, in the drought watch, nor are we in the uh, drought advisory. Okay. So that uh, concludes my water update, and uh, I'll stand for questions. Any questions? Not seeing any. Thank you so much, Mr. Kelly, for your report. Thanks. And uh, I had one request here from uh, Vice Chair Feeblecorn, um, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but if you want to. Thank ask. you, Mr. Chair. And it, the plan might be to have this conversation next week, so Director, just tell me if that, or next month, if this is the case. But I did want to quickly thank um, Ms. Candelaria and Carol and Carlos and Stan for all the work they've done over the last month um, on a potential change to the rate structure, adding a fifth block. Um, potentially next year. We've looked at a lot of the data. We had a lot of questions left, so we didn't want to do it through um, through the ordinance tonight. But um, I would like to have that conversation at some point. And, and again, if it, the plan is to have that on the agenda next month, then I'm fine waiting. But I did want to thank the staff for their work. Thank you, Counselor. And uh, I assume that we'll hear more about this in the next meeting. I'm unclear. If, if you'd like Ms. Candelaria, did you want to say something today or did you want to wait? I don't know the plan. Mr. Director, is that today, next month? What do you care? Um, Mr. Chairman, Councilor Fieber Corn, I think we can do it today. Okay. okay. I'm just, thank okay. you. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification and good evening again. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, Councilor Fieber Corn, members of the board, um, as the Councilor uh, discussed, we had uh, some more discussion after our initial uh, presentation last month regarding the rate study. Um, and one of the areas that we wanted to focus on uh, was really how can we um, achieve additional reduction outside of that current top four tier, okay? So we had a little bit of time to do some analysis. Uh, one scenario we looked at was possibly increasing the rate in that tier. Um, but honestly, the price point is not reasonable. It's so we looked at another option, um, and as the council described, that was adding a fifth block, which means we'd be looking at having a fifth block that would have winter water average exceeding 600%, okay? And a call, along with that would be a, a surcharge. So we looked at that data a little bit. Um, what we found was we still had some consumption, you know, and a high consumption at fifth block, and interestingly, some of those users are institutional and commercial. So I really feel like we owe it to you to come back, give us some more time to take a deep dive into what's going on in those particular classes. Let us know more about those particular customers and not just look at this them as a homogenous group so that we can really be thoughtful about what kind of recommendations we make. Obviously that would include, I think would be important to communicate with those customers. You know, what's going on here? Um, so that we can propose some potential solutions that would really achieve the goal, which is to reduce consumption. Um, so having said that, uh, I understand the counselor would like us to take that uh, direction to continue to study those, uh, that potential option for a fifth tier, um, what that would look like, what the impact would be on customers, and how we can achieve more reduction, uh, more savings on the water consumption. Thank you for allowing this, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you. Yeah, I think that's the plan, I, unless there's concern with the other board members, is just to look at that. Um, this is a lot. 600% of the winter average is a lot of water use. And so um, looking at that more closely, given ourselves time to really look at those accounts, get more data, but with the plan of coming back with a potential proposal for next year. Um, so that's... That would be my suggestion for moving forward, and I, um, I think that yeah. folks on the staff have agreed that that would be a fine thing to, you know, really consider carefully next year. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Member Rail. 
Um, let me ask Ms. Kendall, you mentioned institutional users are part in that account? Yeah, so what we noticed is that um, you look at large universities and hospitals, and um, I'm, I'm but I don't want to answer and tell you what their water is going to. I don't know. I need I need time to investigate that with them. And in conversations with Carlos, one of the thoughts is, well, those are very large facilities. Many of them have added on. They've got um, large plants to operate, and in the summer hot months, they might be using some of that water for cooling. Um, you also look at possibly Expo New Mexico. What's the high season for them? You know, spring, summer, fall. Um, what's that water use look like? Is it indoor? Is it outdoor? I need more time to investigate that to really answer. Mr. Chairman and, and Ms. Candelaria, would that include the city and the county as institutional users, or are we in a different category? So, and that's an excellent question. We actually can segregate the city outdoor because they're irrigation only accounts. So, the answer to your question is that would not include city outdoor facilities like golf courses and parks because they're irrigation only. We have a totally different way to analyze those. We're good. So, but. <laughs> No, I'm but just I will kidding. make a note. Yeah, but I appreciate that. I just wasn't sure what right. uh, all was in that institutional category. Yeah, that would include like government facilities or quasi-government facilities. So, yeah. Okay. And Commissioner Barboa, you had a question. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Candelaria, and thank you, Councillor Fimukorn. I just really appreciate exploring it further. I too thought that um, range was um, too big for those high utilizers, and so just exploring it more and seeing where we can. I just uh, I second, third, it, whatever, okay. um, and, and thank Councillor Fiebelcourt for bringing it to the attention. Councillor Fiebelcourt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to be clear, um, there are some users in every class that are in that high 600% of winter average, and that's one of the reasons that we really didn't come back with you to you with a proposal tonight, because we really need to understand there's residential, there's commercial, there's industrial, there's institutional, like, you, you know, everybody's included in there. And, so we just need to understand that a little more. But again, folks that are using 600% of the winter average, in my opinion, should have a higher rate. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing what they come back with once we have a little more time to research. Thank you, Councilor Fiebelkorn, for your work on this. And, and thank you to our staff that's, that's working on this. I think it's an important oh. issue and looking forward to hearing more. So thanks for bringing this up. Um, with that being said, there is no further items of business on our agenda. So I call this meeting adjourned.